Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. Blue Lava is the first business platform for CISOs to manage their security program. Blue Lava guides security leaders to effectively measure, optimize, and communicate their security program with confidence and ease in one platform. Learn more at bluelava.net. HITRUST is a leading data protection standards development and certification organization that strives to safeguard sensitive information and manage information risk for global organizations across all industries and throughout the third-party supply chain. Learn more at hightrustalliance.net. CrowdSec, the collaborative and open source cybersecurity solution. Analyze behaviors, respond to attacks, and share signals across the community for free. Let's make the internet safer together. Learn more at crowdsec.net. Black Cloak provides concierge cybersecurity protection to corporate executives and high net worth individuals to protect against hacking, reputational loss, financial loss, and the impact of a corporate data breach. Learn more at blackcloak.io. Modern application development needs modern application security. With our award-winning application security testing solutions, Checkmarks enables developers to securely accelerate their work. Learn more at checkmarks.com. AppViewX is trusted by the world's leading global organizations to reduce risk, ensure compliance, and increase visibility through machine identity management and application infrastructure security and orchestration. Learn more at AppViewX.com. And there we are. Where? We are, we are here and there and everywhere in between and then some. There you go. <laughs> you're, uh, you're all very welcome to a new redefining cybersecurity episode here on ITSP Magazine. We are coming to you from uh, RSA conference. Uh, actually, we're, we're covering the event uh, remotely this week. So we have a number of things going on and a uh, number of hosts that are doing some shows uh, live from the event as well. So we encourage everybody to stay tuned to ITSP Magazine forward slash RSAC for everything going on today, right now, here we are redefining cybersecurity. We're looking at InfoSec programs, cybersecurity programs, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I think for me, for this topic, I, I wanted to have a conversation is we can talk about an InfoSec program. And I think there's so much underneath that umbrella that some things can get lost. Um, we focus on best practices. We focus on frameworks. Uh, how, how do we actually build a program that addresses the core needs that we have as a business? And of course, each business has their own unique set of uh, needs and requirements. And what what better time to talk about this particular topic than during RSA conference when there are certainly no lack no lack of products and services and offerings to uh, to share, and everybody's trying to sell somebody something to help with something within their program. And uh, we'll probably touch on that a little bit today. What 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 tools and processes do, or tools do we need? And perhaps maybe processes might be a, a good way to approach this versus p- picking a tool. But uh, I don't know anything here, so I invited. Uh, folks who know much more than myself. So it's great to have uh, Mary Galloway on again and uh, Jay Leslie, new to the show. We're thankful to have you on as well. Thank you both so much for joining. Pleasure. Happy to be here. And of course, uh, my co-founder, Marco, he's going to keep me honest and, and hopefully make this fun. <laughs> well, you also want <laughs> to bring, 
You wanted to bring somebody that knows a little less than you, so you look, you look better. <laughs> well, I look, I, I can at least look better than some, right? I run faster than the bear. Is that our well, good? Maybe you want somebody that is going to ask those questions that maybe they don't come from uh, a cybersecurity expert, but more from a business perspective. So that's going to be my role here. That's today. your role, because oftentimes we get buried in in the minutia and. We know what we know, and we kind of hang on to that because it's comfortable, and sometimes we need to break free of that. Um, let's meet our guest, Marco, for those joining let's live. Uh, Mary, first off, a few words from you, uh, your, your quick view into your journey to this point. Certainly talk about Cyber Jets, you an organization we, we know and cherish and love. Uh, give our audience a view of who Mary is. So by day, I am... Um a new sales engineer for a major cybersecurity vendor um, that's at RSA as well this week. Uh, I specialize in SOC automation and SOC transformation. So um, endpoint, um, automating processes, orchestration, um, attack surface management, uh, all of those, those different areas that help um, organizations build out their SOC and kind of become more effective with their cybersecurity. Um, programs. And then outside of that, I am the CEO and a founding board member for the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. Uh, we are a 501c3 national nonprofit that provides hands-on training to women and girls to help them enter and advance in cybersecurity. Um, so we go to conferences, um, we do study groups, we do workshops, and it's all you know affordable for folks that may not have the funds to go to more expensive training. They get the hands-on, they can go to work the next day and apply what they've learned. Um, Outside of that, I'm a professor, board member, avid volunteer, winemaker, Lego lover, <laughs> all of the fun stuff. <laughs> um, all, imp all important attributes for building yeah. a cybersecurity <laughs> program, mind you. Actually, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're thrilled to have you on, Mary, and, and uh, many from uh, the Cyber Jetsu tribe have been on ITSP Magazine uh, bringing yes. their, their knowledge to bear for those interested in learning with us. And also bringing some knowledge, uh, Jay Leslie. Thanks for uh, thanks for being part of this. A few words about uh, who you are and, and your journey and and uh, your current role. Yeah, thank you, Sean and, and Mari. You had me at winemaker, so I, I, I definitely <laughs> appreciate of wine as well as cybersecurity and IT. We'll um, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so I'm CIO of uh, Cambridge Housing Authority, which is a public housing authority in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, we're a little unique in that we don't focus on specific on just public housing. We actually have a lot of our portfolio privatized now, but that's not why we're here. It's we're here about cybersecurity. And people always ask, like, well, why do you need why do you need IT to public housing authority? And why do you need cybersecurity? And I think the answers are probably obvious to most people here. But on the cyber side, uh, there are assets that we have that people would like to steal. For example, social security numbers, uh, PII generally from our, our residents and our staff, frankly. And we've had some attempts. We've had some people, we've actually had one active business email compromise in our, in our history. And, uh, and that's kind of what really got the program kicked off. That's kind of when management, including myself, were like, you know, we need to really start taking this very seriously. So, and I've always been interested in cybersecurity. So I kind of veered off in that direction a lot more heavily than I had been earlier in my career. I love it. And sad, sad to hear about the BEC. Um, I, I think it's very common and nothing, nothing, of course, uh, for any organization to be ashamed. I think there was some, some chatter on Twitter about a company exposing or sharing that there was a zero day in their, in their platform and some people criticizing them for sharing that and others commending them. And I think commending is, is appropriate here because we're all at risk of something. And, and Jay, I want to start with you uh, just because you're, you're a small organization, well, maybe, not, yeah, a small team anyway, you, as you described it. And I think you made a very important point, and I want, I want to hear your words on this. We're here to talk about cybersecurity, but cybersecurity is important because of something else. And you, you experience something, but the bigger picture is you have – an infrastructure, a, a set of technologies you use to make your organization run, right? And underneath and behind and aside, alongside that are the people that you're trying to do good for. And I think we, we lose that perspective quite often. So maybe if you can help 
our audience understand how you make the connection between the good you're doing for the folks who need housing and more and the IT infrastructure that supports that and the, the, the value that cybersecurity has in making that all possible. That would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we focus, because we're a small team, we try to keep our tool set pretty small as well, because you can only monitor so much. We're just really one and a half people doing cybersecurity. I really want one pane of glass. And the other thing that we keep in mind at Cambridge Housing Authority is that, you know, security is not the goal of the organization. Security is what lets the organization run. So it's not our goal to create the absolute perfect safest environment out there. Uh, we want to be as safe as we can, given the budget that we have for the assets that we have to protect. So that's about risk management and allocating resources. And for us, and for me in particular, since you know I, I created the program here, um, I focus on protecting identity really heavily. Because when you think about it, most hacks now, most cybersecurity breaches, people are breaking through firewalls anymore. That's not really what's going on. People are attacking identity. So how do they do that? Usually you get your credentials fished somehow, or it starts off with a business email compromise. In our case, it didn't really, it wasn't really that serious. Just somebody was like, hey, can you wire out X amount of money? And, and a small amount went out relatively. But uh, that gave us a shock, right? That was a shock to really be able to communicate to management that yes, this is important and to the board that yes, this is important and to get the budget that we need to, to move forward in a way that makes sense. And we try to do so without really, I wouldn't say compromising our users is the wrong way to put it, but we try not to put too much burden on our users with cybersecurity. Yeah, and, and Mary, I wouldn't, your perspective on this as well. I mean, you, you've had many roles and, and clearly you're engaging with a lot of organizations, different sizes, different industries, I would imagine. How, and we're going to get into what the program is in a second, but how, <laughs> how, do you, how do you actually begin to have that conversation for what matters? I mean, in Jay's case, there was a trigger or an event. Um, we shouldn't have to wait for that. So how do you, how do you begin that conversation? usually a trigger or an event. <laughs> I mean, ideally we want folks to think about cybersecurity from the beginning, right? But we have to be realistic. Unless you're a brand new company starting today, you are you haven't thought about security up to this point. So um, usually we, we bring to customers, we say, hey, here's, here's the return on investment if you start to think about cybersecurity now. And here's what's going to happen if you don't, right? In their case, identity information being potentially being stolen or whatever it is um, at the casinos, it was um, our security systems going down and them not being able to play the games on the tables or play on the floor and having to shut the casino down. Right. So we have to, we have to bring it to them from what their requirements are and what they're, what they're most you know, concerned about and then start to say, okay, well, here's how we can implement security in small chunks and small phases that help you, understand, okay, if I do this right now, then I'm protecting this particular type of data or these particular assets. And then I can start to grow and build on that. And it's for us, it's a journey with the customer. It's not a, here you go, put this in, do your thing. It's a, all right, we've, we've identified this. All right, let's move on to the next part of this, this big picture, this whole circle and start to help them build out um, what security should look like in their environment. So, Sean, I'd like to jump in because you mentioned actually before we started a few conversations we had in the past and large organization, many programs, like in the 10, even 20 programs in a large cor corporation. And Jay just mentioned, like, you know, we're a small, small group. Everything comes back together. So on one side, there has been this direction to create all these specialized programs, but don't you miss the big picture and now we're in that phase then maybe everything needs to come back together again otherwise everybody's running his own show so I, I love both of your opinion on that very true very true um our at where i work at it's we're, we're trying to reduce the number of tools people have to go to to do threat hunting to do instant response to do um pretty much running their stock you know, because there's, I think on average, there's like 30 point tools in, in, in any environment. Some cases we've had, we've seen 200. It's like, why do you need 200 different tools with information and data? Uh, 
it's not effective. You can't do active threat hunting that way. You can't truly understand what's happening. Um, and so it's important that everything comes back to one location because your analysts don't have time. There's a lot of alerts that they have to go through and they don't really want to go through that stuff. They're missing things, right? Because we always focus on the critical and the high. We don't focus on the informational or the, the lows because we think, oh, there's no information in there. But that's where understanding what's important to the organization helps build that, build that piece of it out and helps you see, okay, we need to focus on these smaller, less important things because this is where the behavior is happening. And now we can start to bring all that information to one pane of glass. They can see it easier. Folks like Jay and his team can you know, look at one system and pull all of the information from all of their systems in that location. And maybe Jay sometimes hope that he will have 20 programs. <laughs> Jay, Jay, what's, what's yeah, the other I mean, side of the story here? Yeah, so 20, I mean, Mari, I love your comments. I mean, 20, I mean, and that's what happens, right? I talk to other CIOs of other organizations and we're all in the same boat. There's all these threats out there. There's all this bad news. And the solution is all too often, oh, buy one more tool. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help you. Um, and it, I'm not going to advocate for any particular product, but we use Microsoft, uh, pretty much the M65, 365 suite and the defense tools in there. Because again, I'm one person. I can go there and look at the threats. I can look at the vulnerabilities. I When a zero day came out last Thursday, I think, I saw it pop up immediately. It's okay, what can I do about this? And it's like, okay, not very much, but you can push out a PowerShell script that will uh, make that a little bit harder to make it less of an attack surface for you. So for me, that's really important. And for end users, I try to I try to keep the communication up and to make their lives easier. So I once or twice a week will send out a, a, a sample phishing email with red flags. In addition to the fish test and everything we do, we also try to keep it human, keep a connection between myself and the staff and let them know that, yes, you guys are doing a great job. The phishing numbers are going down. They're, tr they're tracking in the right direction. So we do that. But also an example of making things easier for users is we have implemented uh, Windows Hello for Business for our, for our uh, authentication. And the goal there is to get as few people using passwords as possible. So we tied a lot of our systems into one single identity source and tried to reduce our, our password use in the organization with the goal eventually of not even needing a password store. And that's going to take a while, but that's the eventual goal. And what we get out of it is we get like great security. What users get out of it is that they don't have to remember as many passwords. So <laughs> it helps everyone. And Jay, I want to stick with you for a moment because I mean, those those examples are golden from my perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are people, small organizations like your like your own, thinking, okay, here here's a couple things that Jay's doing that I can probably apply. And so I want to I want to get some more of that from you. Um, and I'm just thinking, obviously, as a publication, we have a lot of conversations. We hear a lot of things. We get pitched a lot from from uh, different organizations around stories they have to share. And th there's a lot about frameworks and best practices and um, yeah, the, the new the new threat and you need, you need this new whiz bang technology to, to address that threat. Where do you start? And then Mary, I want your, your thoughts on this from a different size organization. Where, where do you start, Jay, to build your program? to hone your program? Because, I mean, you gave an example of seeing a zero day and, and having uh, a, an alternative mitigation, maybe not the patch yet, um, but an alternative mitigation to kind of reduce the exposure. How do you get from define the program to that point? Well, you know, I do use frameworks. I mean, I think they're really important as a, as a base. Um, Honestly, we probably don't stick to it as much as, as, as a lot of organizations do, but we use the CIS 20 framework actually. And what I try to do is make sure that you're addressing each major component, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. You want tools that cover that base. And that forms a good, you know, that's a good framework from which everything else in your program kind of hangs off of. And I think it's important to have that base because otherwise you will get into, you will end up with tool suites, uh, uh, tool, Creep, I was trying to say, sorry. Um, for example, if you have too many detection tools, like Mari was saying, you'll get to the point where you're paying a lot of money for stuff that you really don't need and it's really not serving any purpose to you. And Mary, your, your, your thoughts on how, how to 
let's just look big picture now because it, it's really the uh, Jay mentioned the I think it's the five buckets in the CIS twenty right. Um, it's a good way to to start to look at something, um, but but how do you actually bring it to the to the next level? By tools, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, really, it boils down to what are you trying to protect? Why are you trying to protect that? And what visibility you have into your environment, right? Most organizations have no clue what's going on in their environment, and if you don't know what you have, if you don't know who's accessing data or who you know, can can transfer funds from this account to that account. If you don't know those things, you you need to find that out. You need to figure that out and map that out first. Um, then once you start to understand, okay, where are my tools, where are my data lies, where my people are, um, what they're accessing, then you can start to say, okay, what's the, we like to do it the quickest thing that we can implement first that helps us get to that point of complete security. So if that means changing passwords out or changing from regular passwords to MFA or whatever, and that's going to be your easiest, quickest thing to do, you start there. And then you start to prioritize the next parts of those that story. You know, what's next? All right, now let's move everybody from using HPs to using something else, right? And that's another bigger a bigger chunk of it. Okay, now we're done there. All right, let's move on to the next part of it. But you have to identify that stuff at the beginning and understand what your requirements are, what your board's looking for, what regulations you may have to abide by, if it's HIPAA or PCI or, or um, any of the other things that are out there that people use based on their industry. And then you can start to build that out. Because a lot of those frameworks, they have those steps, like the CIS. They, the first thing on the CIS is what's your inventory look like? Asset management. <laughs> so that should always be the first place people start. And what's the role of the business in this? I mean, do the business need to create his own program to deal with the cybersecurity program, or is there a translator there that that connects? <laughs> you know, we, we always talk about the CISO sitting at the board table, learning to speak business and, and so forth. So, um, Mary, what's, what's your experience they, on that? They have to be there early on so that they can get an understanding of what what's really happening, right? Those are your stakeholders. You have to build those relationships. They have to be in part of that a conversation. Otherwise, they feel like security is just a burden. It's just one of those things that's like, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to spend the money. Um, but if you can show how cybersecurity impacts them, they'll, they'll buy in a little bit more. Is it happening? We know they need to be there. Are they there now? It's More been, than two years ago, three, four, five? Probably, I, th I think with the uptick, with everybody going virtual, going working from home, that kind of forced us to rethink our operations and rethink our perimeter and where information is at. So I think now we're starting to see a, a bigger uptick in folks coming in because there's fines involved if you get breached. You know, there's reputation lost. So it's like, wait a minute, I need to be a part of this conversation too. So we want to protect our data. We want to protect whoever our patrons are. You know, in the casino world, it's the the gamblers, the folks who like to gamble, or you know, the high rollers. We want to protect all those people. So how do we do that? Um, and so they they're starting to come in. Um, when I talk to customers, periodically we'll see some of the business units in those conversations, um, asking questions, mostly around budget <laughs> and how it's going to impact them. But <laughs> it's a start. <laughs> So, so Jay, when when I look at a large organization, I mean, we we talk about tens, maybe even maybe even twenty programs within within a large organization. So, when you look at an endpoint and network and and uh, compliance and privacy and and identity and all these can be different programs. You have the joy of of kind of consolidating all that um, without, I'll say, perhaps the benefit of a large team to kind of bounce ideas off. Right. What is what is the story of, of Cambridge housing that we want to protect? What, where are we at risk? Uh, how do I know that that risk is real? Uh, where where in the CIS can can we apply some controls to either reduce exposure or mitigate some of that risk in some way? How do you have how do you how do you get what you need? 
so you're not kind of isolated in your own view of what you think is important, um, both from an organizational perspective and then perhaps even from a larger community perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I really keep in touch with as many other CIOs and CISOs as I can. So I go to conferences, I go to especially identity conferences. Uh, I talk to my CIO, my colleague CIOs, CIOs at other housing authorities on a regular basis. And we share information. We share information about the tools we're using, the threats we're facing, and make sure that we're kind of almost becoming like a bigger group, right? Because each of us is a small organization, but we all bring something a little bit different to the table. And when you're all willing to speak honestly, put it on the table, you can basically have the effect of a larger team. Team of knowledge. They're not going to come and actually do any real work for me, but you know, it, but, but, <laughs> but when it comes to actually analyzing the environment, absolutely, we are there for each other. But that 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 knowledge is there, and I'm. I mean, we all were human. We make mistakes, right? And so, even if they're not coming in to tune your firewall, uh, they may be able to share with you, hey, if you tune your firewall this way, you, you can eliminate X percent of the likelihood of of this phishing attack or this phishing phishing uh, model to succeed. Um, Mary, you're shaking your head there. How? How, how, when maybe at the gambling uh, organization you work for, how, how do you, how do you kind of get a handle of sub program, bigger program to understand identity is important? This is the next project versus, um, yeah, access control uh, and, and privacy is as another one. So, in the, in the case of the casino, um, they got hacked, they got breached from their location in Pennsylvania. There was some like old infrastructure, some ICS stuff, industrial control system stuff that had a tunnel to the location in Las Vegas. At the time, they only had maybe maybe 10 people in their SOC, but they were overwhelmed with alerts and things happening and trying to manage and build that up. Um, so the first thing that, before I came on the team, the first thing that they did was build out what their team needed to look like. Okay, what roles do we need in here? We, we have the SOC, but all right, we need vulnerability management folks. Okay, we need incident response folks. Okay, we need, we need forensics people because they need us to figure out how the folks got in, right? And I, and I want to say Darknet Diaries posted a quick story on it a couple of years ago about what happened, um, but that was how that started. And from there, um, the CISO at the time, who's still there, I believe, he, he built the team out over the course of four or five years. It was a global team. Um, but it started from a breach. And it was like, okay, well, what is a typical large scale? Because the casino is a huge casino, right? There's a lot of people. There's a lot of information. So what would a company this size need outside of just tools? And that's how they built it out. And it, it was over time, right? We, we, we didn't have a governance and risk team right away. There was maybe like one or two people then that team started to grow. Then there was a security awareness team and that started to grow. And then the forensics team started to grow. And so that's, that's how they, they built it out based on that breach. Yeah. I want to share what you feel comfortable sharing, but I mean, and, and maybe Mary has a thought on this as well, because I'm thinking you both said an event or something, some breach triggered this. And I'm wondering, I mean, that, that's a good way to raise awareness and a good way for us to then hopefully take some action, right? We want to reduce the, uh, the impact of that and hopefully learn from it. And it, so my question to you is, how did, how did that help you shape? And I think, Jay, in your case, it kind of started your, your program, Mary, um, your perspective perhaps after on how to redefine a program. And I know Marco wants to take this somewhere after. So, Jay, how... I guess what I'm what I'm wondering is, do you are you able to define a program that's sustained based on that event, or did you find that that your program was a, a response to that event, and then you then you had to redefine it later once once you kind of got your your head square again <laughs> after yeah the activities. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So a little of both, really. It, it helped to start the program, but really information security programs are constantly evolving. You, you, you write them in two or three year chunks, but really they're evolving in every month, every mm-hmm. yeah, every time a new activity comes out, a new breach comes out, you're redefining to some extent your program. So it's, a, it's more of a roadmap. It's a broad roadmap. You can take different stops along the way. You might stop at Wendy's, you might stop somewhere else, but uh, but yeah, but it, it, it doesn't restrict you. It's, it's how you get where you're going. And for us, it was really helpful since it was a business email compromise. It really got us to focus on our, our email infrastructure. And we had uh, we were using uh, Microsoft 365 M365, but we weren't doing things like DMARC, for example, and we didn't have our SPF records con- uh, configured correctly. So I basically crash course myself in that, <laughs> set up our DMARC, re- DMARC records correctly, got our SPF records set up. And then it was pretty then it was pretty good that we did the, the, the the breach happened because of spoofing, right? Somebody spoofed our email domain and was able to convince somebody inside that, hey, this is legit, let's act on it. But you try to make that stuff as hard as possible. It's never going to be impossible, but you try to put up as many barriers as you can. And Mary, your thoughts on this before Marco goes, because it, I mean, that that's a great thing to do, right? DMARC and SPIF mm-hmm. and, and setting those controls around your email system. Dude, uh, does how, how do we not do that? Um, is it just because we don't know yet, or it's is it missing from from best practices, or how, how do we how do we overcome some of that? I mean, there's there's so many there's so many different tools, right? So it's just a matter of what is a specific tool going to do, and and you won't know necessarily unless you're like digging deep into the tools and how they work and what should should be done. I don't know if I've ever seen that in what you were talking about, Jay, in best practice. Um, it might be in there. I don't know. That's it, what I'm wondering if, and maybe this is a question for the vendors that aren't on, but it, should, should this stuff not be secured by default? Um, well, I don't know. Is it, that not possible? I don't it know. depends. Again, it depends on your environment. Like there's cer- certain things you can do in an industrial control system environment. And there's certain things you can't, or it doesn't matter what the vendor is. So it just depends on what your environment looks like, what other measures you have in place that whole defense in depth thing that we talked about ages ago and the CISSP stuff and all that, um, it's going to depend on a lot of different things. So if you don't have anything in place, then obviously you want to put some of those, the DMARC and those things in into position. But if you have other things, it may not be a priority for you to do, even though it's probably a really good idea to do. Um, but as Jay said, you're always redefining your yeah. security program. As you move from on-prem to cloud, you're redefining what that looks like. As you move from, you know, using PowerShell to using AI, you're redefining what your program looks like. So it's a, it's a constant redefining, um, restructuring, re, redoing types of thing. But as long as you have the foundation, I think I think you're good. Yeah. And of course, that was in no way a, a dig at you, Jay, in your program. It's just a bigger, <laughs> no, big, a bigger question. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think we, we can do better, better here. And I'm just wondering how, how we can do that. Marco. Yeah, well, like, like oh, ahead, oh, sorry. No, it's like Mary, like Mary was saying, it, it's it's about what you have in place already. Like if, if you have something like you know Mimecast in place that's configured correctly and up and running, then that control is kind of covered, and you don't have to think as much about DMARC and, and your and getting your records configured because uh, you know Mimecast can cover a lot of that for you. But and also to Mary's point, I don't think DMARC, I don't think those, that record setup is in any best practices anywhere. I mean, I think it's within industry. It's like in a public housing industry, we've we've kind of say that now internally. But we made it up. <laughs> we just made it up from experience. <laughs> we just said, if you do this, you're less likely to experience a business right. email compromise. So let's all do that. Right. And that comes from research. He researched yeah. that to figure out, okay, how do we protect against this? And that's pretty much what the industry does. It's just about, a re- it's about research and figuring out what works best for your organization. All right, so talking about what works best, and I, I still have this one program versus many programs. And I like to think, like, what, what is your objective and what is your goal is going to define if you succeed or not, right? So how you define success, and is it that having that one program that succeed or that one program that fail? Or it's okay if something doesn't work in this constant change 
right? I mean, you talked about using one technology versus another. We know it's never ending. We know we cannot protect everything. So who in the end make, gives the, the goal and how do we define success as one program versus the globality, the program, the, the cybersecurity program of the company? Your board. <laughs> Do, do, oh, they, okay. do they know enough to, to do that? But, so that's the other problem. They don't always. <laughs> All right. So let's um, talk about that. But your board makes the your board tells you what the goals are, right? It's your job as the CIO, the CISO, whatever, whatever role it is to figure out how to reach that goal, whether that's with one program or with multiple. Um, I don't see I don't see like governance and rents as it's governance and risk as its own program. I don't see incident response as its own program. I see it just as a piece of the main information security, cybersecurity program for the organization. And those are just little, you know, silos or whatever, speedboats or whatever you want to call them. Um, so if one of those areas fails or isn't as successful, doesn't necessarily mean your program is unsuccessful. It just means you need to rework and figure out how do we make this piece of it more successful. It may it be, and then Jay, you, you, you can go, but may it be, I'm being a little polemic here, that the board doesn't know enough, but they, the stakeholders are saying this seems to be important. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about it. We need to do something about it, but maybe it's just on the front just to show that we're doing something. But it's really, if I'm I'm being very polemic here. So, <laughs> go ahead, Jay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the best of all possible worlds, all boards would have someone with cybersecurity experience on the board, right? They don't. I mean, it's it's. I think we're starting <laughs> to think in that direction, but right now we're just not there yet. You'll have fiscal experts, but you don't really have cybersecurity experts mm -hmm. on boards to the extent that we should, given the risks that we're facing. So given that, I mean, I think it's our job as cybersecurity professionals to educate both management and the board and to, you know, yet they set the agenda. Mary's absolutely right. I mean, they set the agenda, but sometimes I feel like we have to kind of tweak them a little bit and say, hey, this is really important. This is something we need to be thinking about and and then show how you're, you're then measure against that. Like, for example, if we're trying to, you know, I know I keep parking on email, but uh, if, we, if we're trying to reduce phishing, you know, we do monthly fish tests. And we can go back and say, well, you know, fishing has stayed at this level and we like, that's where we want to keep it or it's going up or it's going down. But we can communicate that um, in terms of like, you know, a passwordless identification. I, I can report on how many users are actually using it out of out of the uh, it's available to everyone. And I haven't done that measurement yet. It's pretty, pretty new program. But, you know, by the end of summer, I want to know exactly how many people have switched from passwords to passwordless. And then I want to correlate that to information about like what gets stolen, like what, how identity is attacked mm -hmm. and say that, and be able to say that because we don't have passwords to steal in that area of cybersecurity, we're that much safer. And Jay, can you, can you describe that conversation? Maybe a little role playing. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> cause, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, we, we say we want cybersecurity knowledge at the board level. Do, do we have, product engineers at the board level? And do we, do we expect them to, to say this is a good agile model or that one sucks? Or I, I'm just wondering, are, are we expecting too much there? Cause I, I think it's really about the conversation to help anybody understand. Right. And so maybe, maybe if you can kind of describe the conversation around, well, why this password list and what does success look like that, for that program when you when you reach it maybe not 100 percent, but when you reach 75 percent, we we've achieved success and here's why um you, you mentioned not as much stuff getting stolen so how do you how do you have that conversation to make it real well it's about risk rich is you know risk management is why you have finance folks on the board and finance and people who are financially literate on corporate boards and you know Product development, that's covered in other areas. I mean, that's covered in other areas of management. But, you know, cybersecurity is such an externally facing risk right now that it should be right up there with, the, with fiscal responsibility. And, you know, we have the tools to provide boards the information they need to, to evaluate how their companies are doing. And, you know, again, we're just not there yet. As far as how the conversation goes, 
it can be it can be interesting. It can be difficult. It probably doesn't happen enough, but I think the goal is to not scare them, right? The goal is scare or maybe scare them just enough. It it to because I think there is a risk of overplaying threats and getting to the point where it's like, well, if everything's dangerous, then then that's just the way the world is. There's nothing we can do. So I think you always want to be able to portray the idea and the correct idea that there's there's plenty we can do. We just have to decide what to act on and, and how best to go down that road and how much money to spend on those risks given the given the threat. So you, you don't want to spend more than the assets worth that, that you're protecting is worth, but you do want to be able to protect all your assets appropriately. This is where tools come into play. Tools can be very helpful here with with metrics and showing the you know the success and showing where you were a month ago to where you are now. So it, it's let's go back to the success and how you get the money to to protect the company. B, so the B, BEC, trade. we know it's a business email company. <laughs> right there, you go. <laughs> so you know, I mean, we 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 were. Uh, fear driven and now we are investment driven or at least i i try to think we're almost there like it's security as an investment cybersecurity as a as an added value to the product to the brand to the company in general so again when can you feel comfortable to go back to the board as a CISO and say all right this this worked give me more money because uh we got we got to keep doing it it's not just one one ticket right you you, you need the season ticket here yeah. repetitive riding of that roller coaster it's not just one game you got to win the whole <laughs> season we need the support mary so i don't have that answer cuz i don't talk to the board <laughs> on anything security related not our board at least <laughs> but if you did what would um, you say here no um i honestly I, when you first go to them i i feel like having the big picture in mind and thinking about what it looks like holistically um even if they say no we're only going to fund this small piece of it at least they've seen the full budget and so now they they're, they're already aware of what funds are needed and where this can go so once you show them the success it's like all right here here's that budget again here's what we need to continue to do this is how we continue to keep your organization safe, your business safe, keep money in your pocket because most board members are paid um, and they like to have money come in every quarter. And so this is how we keep more money in your in your pocket. Right. And it all boils back to, like you said, investments. Am I losing money? Am I gaining money? What's happening? And that's what I mean, that's how these organizations thrive is with funds and if you can show that by doing these things, it's going to save X, Y, Z dollars for this other stuff. I think that that's helpful. And Jay, I like your your thoughts on this as well. And maybe if it makes sense, uh, your your personal view of when it feels good to you, right? So there's success for the company, but you don't want to uh, destroy your own self in the process, right? right? You, you don't want to run a program that's heavily underfunded and and still exposed. And but it, but that's what you got. So how how do you your thoughts on that same question, but perhaps some of your own personal thoughts on success for yourself in the role. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think for me, a lot of it's about being able to show kind of a life cycle management of your investments. Uh, you know, the investment that you made five years ago on a product, you know, if you had to evaluate the effect of this, right? Like, you know, five years hence, it may not be as necessary as it once was. And I, I mean, I have a you know, very small example of that, but, you know, we used to buy uh, web root licenses for antivirus. And that was before we had uh, Microsoft M365. And turns out there's an excellent, uh, really goes back beyond the antivirus endpoint de uh, detection response platform built into that. So at some point you're like, okay, why are we paying for WebRoot then? Why are we paying for some other things? Let's roll back that investment and be able to show management and the board that we're still protecting the organization. We don't need these components anymore. Let's reinvest some of that investment we're, we've been making on a year to year basis, basis into something new that's more appropriate to the threats we're facing now. Uh, great. Another great example. Uh, maybe, maybe not one Weber who wants to hear, but uh, it's, it's reality, right? We have to consistently look at uh, what's going on and how our program's functioning and, and listen to the bells in our ears to say, hey, there's something we need to pay attention to here. I'm joking a little bit there, but I mean, 
Mary and Jay, uh, this is a, a great conversation, especially one uh, to be had during uh, RSA conference week. And uh, I mean, examples from both of you spot on, I think some good advice for folks here. Um, many sub programs, the big picture, I think is what we, we kind of all said is, is important and leaning on each other in the community and your peers to find what matters most to you and, and help shortcut, not in a, uh, in a weak way, but in a strong way, leverage the, the, the learnings from your peers to streamline and, and fast track, I should say, uh, some program uh, elements that uh, may have taken you some time to, to figure out on your own. So uh, I'm going to stop rambling and, and thank you both for, for uh, joining for this conversation and, and telling your story today. Definitely happy to be here. And if anybody yes, needs anything, let me know. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's the, the beauty of this community. We're all always around uh, to help each other. And speaking of that, uh, those watching live uh, during RSA Conference Week, appreciate you do joining us for that. Uh, we have many more conversations throughout the week. Uh, we're just getting started. And uh, we're re redefining a lot of stuff. And uh, some of our other hosts are changing things and living and breathing tech and we have a lot going on so stay tuned to itspmagazine.com forward slash rsac for all going on there again jay mary thanks so much marco glad he joined for this one as well oh yeah love it redefining the way we cover events that's what we're i doing. know exactly and there i was is. i was noticing the number of the, the many times we said redefining during this conversation. Which is, uh, which Maybe is we need to redefine our vocabulary. <laughs> redefine right, let's vocabulary. transform it as our <laughs> yeah, yeah. he is this year transforming. Ah, uh, thank you, Mary. I was going <laughs> to go there. I'm like, how am I going to commit? Transform. <laughs> transform. Right. As we have learned from our first chats on the road to the conference, yes. our friends, the organizers, and, right. uh, and again, transformation, change, and humanity. The human element, I, the human element. I, I think is always important. We didn't touch much on that today, but um, I think it's definitely in the back of our mind all the time. Right on. Right I'm on. Gonna, I'm going to go back to being human. So thanks, everybody. Catch you on all the right. next one. Thank, Thank you, all. you all. Take care. Bye-bye. AppView X is trusted by the world's leading global organizations to reduce risk, ensure compliance, and increase visibility through machine identity management and application infrastructure security and orchestration. Learn more at appviewx.com. Modern application development needs modern application security. With our award-winning application security testing solutions, Checkmarks enables developers to securely accelerate their work. Learn more at checkmarks.com. Black Cloak provides concierge cybersecurity protection to corporate executives and high net worth individuals to protect against hacking, reputational loss, financial loss, and the impacts of a corporate data breach. Learn more at blackcloak.io. CrowdSec, the collaborative and open source cybersecurity solution. Analyze behaviors, respond to attacks, and share signals across the community for free. Let's make the internet safer together. Learn more at crowdsec.net. HITRUST is a leading data protection standards development and certification organization that strives to safeguard sensitive information and manage information risk for global organizations across all industries and throughout the third-party supply chain. Learn more at hightrustalliance.net. Blue Lava is the first business platform for CISOs to manage their security program. Blue Lava guides security leaders to effectively measure, optimize, and communicate their security program with confidence and ease in one platform. Learn more at bluelava.net. If you enjoyed this podcast, share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. Thank you for listening.